Good morning. I've come here to share with you an experiment of how to get rid of one form of human suffering. It really is a story of Dr. Venkateswamy, his mission and his message. It's about the Aravind Eye Care System. I think first it's important for us to recognize what it is to be blind. Well, if you are a Kamala, we are not going to Becoming blind is the big part of it, but I think it also deprives the person of their livelihood, their dignity, their independence, and the status in the family. So she's just one amongst the millions who are blind, and the irony is that they don't need to be. A simple well-proven surgery can restore sight to millions, and something even simpler, a pair of glasses, can make millions more see. If we add to that, the many of us here you know, who are more productive because we have a pair of glasses, then almost one in five Indians will require eye care. It's staggering 200 million people. Today, we're reaching not even 10 percent of them. So this is the context in which Arvind came into existence about 30 years back as a post-retirement project of Dr. V. He started this with uh, no money, had to mortgage his, uh, all his life savings to make a bank loan. And uh, over time, we have grown into a network of five hospitals, predominantly in the state of Tamil Nadu and uh, Pondicherry. And then we added several uh, what we call as vision centers and as a hub and spoke model. And then more recently, we started managing uh, hospitals in other parts of the country and also setting up hospitals in other parts of the world as well. In the last three decades, uh, we have done about three and a half million surgeries, uh, a vast majority of them uh, for the poor people. Uh, now each year, we perform about uh, 300,000 surgeries. A typical day at Aravind, we would do about 1,000 surgeries, maybe see about 6,000 patients. Uh, send out teams into the villages to examine, bring back patients, uh, lots of telemedicine consultations, and on top of that, uh, do a lot of training, uh, both for doctors and uh, technicians who will become the future uh, staff of Aravind. And then doing this day in and day out, and doing it well, uh, requires a lot of inspiration and a lot of hard work. And I think uh, this was possible thanks to the building blocks uh, put in place by Dr. V, uh, a value system, an efficient delivery process, and fostering the, the culture of innovation. I used to sit with the ordinary village man because I am from a village. And suddenly he turned around, and then you see he seemed to contact his inner being. You seem to be one with him. But here is a soul which has got all the simplicity of confidence. Doctor, whatever you say, I accept it. An implicit faith in you. And then you respond it. Here is an old lady who has got so much faith in me, I must do my best for her. When we grow in spiritual consciousness, we are into ourselves with all that is in the world. So there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping. It is ourselves we are healing. This helped us build a very ethical and very highly patient-centric organization and systems that, that support it. But on a practical level, you also have to deliver services efficiently. Okay? And uh, or it may seem, the inspiration came from McDonald's. The concept is simple. They feel they can train people all over the world, irrespective of different religions, different culture, different all those things, to produce a product in the same way 
and deliver it in the same manner in hundreds of places. He kept talking about McDonald's and hamburgers, and none of it made any sense to us. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to create a franchise, a, a, a mechanism of delivery of eye care with the efficiency of McDonald's. Supposing I'm able to produce eye care techniques, methods, and all those things in the same way and make it available in every corner of the world, the problem of blindness is gone. If you think about it, I think the, the eyeball is the same, whether it's American, Indian, or African. The problem is the same, the treatment is the same, and yet why should there be so much variation in quality and in service? And that was the fundamental uh, principle that we followed when we designed the delivery systems. And of course, the challenge was that it's a huge problem, talking of millions of people, very little resource to, to deal with it, and then lots of logistics and, and affordability issues. And then so one had to constantly innovate and one of the early innovations, which still continues, is to create ownership in the community to the problem and then engage uh, with them as a partner. And here is one such event, yeah, a community camp, uh, which is organized uh, by the uh, community themselves, uh, where they find a place, organize volunteers, and then we do our part, you know, check the vision. And then you have doctors who do, you find out what the problem is and then determine what further tests need to be done. And th those tests are done by uh, technicians uh, who check for glasses or check for glaucoma. And then with all these results, the, the doctor makes a final diagnosis and then decide a line of treatment. And if they need a pair of glasses, it's available uh, right there at the campsite, usually under a tree. Uh, but they get glasses in the frames of the choice, and that's very important because I think glasses, in addition to helping people see, is also a fashion statement, and they're willing to pay for it. Yeah. So they get it within about 20 minutes, and then uh, those who require uh, surgery uh, are counseled, and then there are buses waiting, uh, which would uh, uh, transport them to the base hospital. And if it was not for this um, kind of a logistics and support, I mean, people like this would probably never get services, and certainly uh, not when they most need it. No, they receive uh, surgery the following day, uh, and then they would stay for a day or two, uh, and then they are put back uh, in the buses uh, to be taken back to where they came from and where their uh, families will be waiting to uh, uh, take them back home. And this happens several thousand times um, each year. Uh, it, it may sound very impressive that we're seeing lots of patients, very efficient process, but we looked at how are we solving the problem. We did a study, a scientifically designed process, and then to our dismay, we found this was only reaching 7% of those in need. And we're not adequately addressing more bigger problems. So we had to do something different, so we set up what we call as um, uh, primary eye care centers, vision centers. These are truly paperless offices with uh, uh, completely electronic medical records and so on. They receive comprehensive eye exam. We kind of changed a simple digital camera into a retinal camera, and then every patient gets a teleconsultation with a doctor. Uh, the, the, the effect of this has been that within the first year, we really had a 40% penetration in the market that it served, which is about 50,000 people. And the second, it went up to 75%. So I think we have a process by which we can really penetrate into the market and reach uh, everyone who needs it. And in this process of using technology, made sure that most don't need to come to the base hospital. And how much do they pay for this? We fixed the pricing, taking into account what they would save in bus fare in coming to a city, so they pay about 20 rupees, and that's good for three consultations. <laughs> the other challenge was how do you give uh, high-tech or more advanced treatment, and here we uh, designed a van with a uh, VSAT, which uh, sends out images of patients to the uh, base hospital where it is diagnosed, 
And then as the patient is waiting, the report goes back to the patient. Uh, it gets printed out, the patient uh, gets it, uh, and then gets a consultation about what they should be doing. I mean, go see a doctor or come back after six months. And then this happens uh, as a way of uh, bridging the, the technology competence. So the impact of all this has been essentially one of growing the market, uh, because we focused on the non-customer, and then by, doing, by reaching the unreached, we were able to significantly grow the market. The other aspect is how do you deal with this efficiently? Now, when you have very few ophthalmologists, so what you see in this video uh, is a surgeon operating, and then you see on the other side, another patient is getting ready. So as they finish their surgery, they just swing the microscope over, the tables are placed so that the distance is uh, just right, and then we need to do this, because by doing this kind of process, we're able to more than quadruple the, the productivity of the surgeon. And then to support the surgeon, we required a certain workforce, and then we focused on um, uh, village girls that we recruited, and then they really are the backbone of the organization. I mean, they do almost all of the skill-based routine tasks. They do one thing at a time, they do it extremely well. Uh, with the result, we have very high productivity, very high quality at very, very low cost. So putting all this together, what really happened was that the productivity of our staff uh, was significantly higher than uh, anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very busy table, but what this really is conveying is that when it comes to quality, we have put in uh, very good quality assurance systems. As a result, uh, our complications are significantly lower than what has been reported in the uh, in United Kingdom. And you don't see those numbers often. Yeah. So the final part of the puzzle is, how do you make all this work financially, especially when the people can't pay for it? So what we did was we gave away a lot of it for free. And then those who pay, I mean, they paid uh, local market rates, nothing more, and often much less. And we were helped by the market inefficiency. I think that has been a big uh, savior even now. And of course, one needs a mindset to be wanting to uh, give away what you have as a surplus. The result has been, over the years, the expenditure increased with volumes. The revenues increased at a higher level, giving us a healthy margin, while you're treating a large number of people for free. I think in, in absolute terms, last year we earned about uh, 20 odd million dollars, spent about 13 million, with about a 40% EBITDA. <clears throat> uh, but this really requires uh, going beyond what we do or what we have done uh, if you really want to achieve solving this problem of blindness. And uh, what we did was a couple of very counterintuitive things. Uh, we created competition for ourselves, uh, and then we made eye care affordable by making a low cost consumables. We proactively and systematically uh, promoted best practices to many hospitals in India, many in our own backyards, and then in other parts of the world as well. The impact of this has been that these hospitals, in the second year after our uh, consultation, uh, doubled their output, you know, and then achieved uh, financial uh, uh, recovery as well. The other part was, how do you um, address this increasing cost of technology. So there was a time when we failed to negotiate the prices to be at affordable levels, so we set up a, a manufacturing unit. And then over time, uh, we were able to bring down the cost significantly to about 2% of what it used to be uh, when we started out. Uh, today, we believe uh, we have about 7% of the global market, and they're used in about 120 odd countries. To conclude, I mean, what we do does it have a broader relevance, no? or, or is it just um, India or developing countries? So to address this, we studied uh, UK versus Aravind. Yeah? What it shows is that we do roughly about 60% of the volume of what UK does. They do half a million surgeries as a whole country, and we do about uh, 300,000. And then we train about 50 ophthalmologists against the 70 trained by them. 
comparable quality, both in training and in uh, patient care. So we're really comparing apples to apples. Yeah? Uh, we looked at costs. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I think it is simple to say it's just because it's UK and India, the difference is happening. I think there's more to it. I mean, I think one has to look at uh, other aspects as well. Maybe there is uh, the solution to the cost could be in productivity, maybe in efficiency in the clinical process, or in how much they pay for the lenses or consumables, uh, regulations, the defensive practice. So I think decoding this can probably bring answers to uh, most uh, developed countries, uh, including the U.S., and maybe Obama's ratings can go up again. <laughs> <clears throat> Another insight, which I want to again uh, leave with you, uh, in conditions where the problem is very large, which cuts across all economic strata, where we have a good solution, I think the process that I described, you know, productivity, quality, patient-centered care, can give an answer. And there are many which fit this paradigm. You, know, you take dentistry, hearing aid, maternity, and so on. There are many where this paradigm can apply. But I think probably one of the more challenging things is on the soft side. You know, how do you create compassion? You know, how do you make people own the problem, want to do something about it? They are probably a bit harder issues. And I'm sure people in this crowd can probably find the solutions to this. So I want to end my talk leaving this thought and challenge to you. When we grow in spiritual consciousness, we are into ourselves with all that is in the world, so there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping, it is ourselves we are healing. Thank you very much. Traffic is a global epidemic. US traffic is creating 45% of the world's air pollution. In the UK, time wasted in traffic costs 20 billion a year. Would you pay for cleaner air and a faster commute? Stockholm put it to a vote. I voted for it, yes. I voted for it. I vote for it. We're not old enough to vote. Vote. <laughs> We had to do something in Stockholm to improve the environment and to get a better flow in the traffic. We put a price on taking your car into the central parts of Stockholm and we call that congestion charges. If you start a system like this and it doesn't work on the first day, then you will be in big trouble. It must be perfect from day one. There are 18 entry gates to the city. Each is equipped with cameras. Pictures are taken of the rear and front license plates. These pictures are sent to a central system that identifies the license plates and makes sure that the right person pays for the right passages. One of the obstacles we overcame was the OCR, the optical character reading of the license plate. We went out to IBM's global organization and the R&D centers and find a very good software we could use. And we managed to implement it in two months' time. This is the heart of the system where all images and passages are being processed. Over 99% of all pictures are correctly identified. No, it's nice. This is how it should be all the time. Behind me you can see the traffic, and the clock is 6 p.m. Before we had the congestion charging, the traffic was chewing up at this time of the day. I think it's a good idea, because I think that we should take care of the environment in the city. The traffic went down with about 22%, and the air pollution was about 14% better. It's a huge international interest from different parts of the world, from uh, the United States, from Latin America, from China. And it's really a pleasure to tell people not what we are planning to do, but what we actually have done in Stockholm. I voted for it. Yes, I did. Not my husband, so <laughs> but I did. I think he is not thinking like me for the future. I'm thinking for the children and the grandchildren.